Welcome to the Spirit of Mayflower podcast with me, Rachel Carter. I'd like to welcome to the podcast uh, a very special guest. It's uh, horticulturalist John Sterland. Welcome to the podcast, John. Oh, lovely to speak to you, Rachel. It's grand to be on it, actually. <laughs> oh, thank you. We, we met um, a couple of years ago, didn't we? And um, yes. we, uh, we realised that we were both um, in the Pilgrim Roots region and we were both doing Mayflower projects. And uh, we got in touch via Twitter, I think it was, and said, um, let's meet for coffee and cake, didn't we? <laughs> yes i remember it i remember it yes and we we um met at the garden your local garden center where i give a bit of advice and we had a we had a real good chat well that wasn't the first time no we met in nottingham That's wasn't right. it yeah and then most of the other meetings that we've had have been at your local garden center yeah yeah that's right would you uh, give us a, a little bit of background um on yourself, John. So uh, you're a horticulturalist, but I know you've got a lot, yeah. of, a lot more uh, strings to your bow, don't you? <laughs> oh yes. I'm, well, I've, I've been a horticulturist all my life. I I did my apprenticeship very quickly. I did my apprenticeship at Boots under some sticklers and fantastic growers, and uh, so I learned the best way possible to uh, to look after plants and things like that. And um, yes, I, I went on to um, do the radio. I did Radio Nottingham answering questions for 42 years. Um, I've done a bit of telly as well with a, a colleague, Martin Fish. We did a, a program called Simply Gardening uh, for Carlton, 12 week program. And um, yes, and now um, at the age I am, I've moved over to actually Radio Lincoln. BBC Radio Lincolnshire. I wasn't going to, I was going to retire, but I, I enjoyed their programme so much. As I said, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd do a few with those. So that's what I'm doing now, yes, and it's um, thoroughly enjoying it. Oh, good. Yeah, you're, you're always such a, a busy guy, you know, um, but I, I so love our, our gets togethers and um, when we sort of meet up for coffee and cake and we have a good chat and it always ends in the buying of some plants doesn't it <laughs> yes it, well, yes you buying plants yes definitely <laughs> oh, well dear. well whilst you're at uh, you know in, in a garden center with you know someone with 50 years experience like yourself it's uh, it's hard not to sort of um, <laughs> Pull on that experience. So, John, what do you think yes, about well, it, this? <laughs> it, it's one of me. It's it has one of been one of my favourite things going over on a Saturday and uh, giving people advice. But um, unfortunately, at the present times, it isn't. Uh, I, I'm not able to. So, um, you know, but giving advice to people after you, from from your experience, it's all from my experience because I've done so much growing vegetables. Also, every aspect of gardening, apart from design, really, yeah. I'm a bit of a you know back of a fag packet and just plant <laughs> put plants in, and um, and they they grow normally because I know what I'm doing. But um, yeah, I I just loved it all. And one of the uh, things that um, you know you you've been doing in the recent years is been cultivating or growing the Pilgrim 400. So this is a, a new special apple tree. So can you tell us, you know, how did it start? How do you find uh, a new apple? It's amazing. It didn't take too long, actually. I thought it was going to take a lifetime. But uh, back in 2015, I was thinking, how can horticulture um, celebrate the pilgrims going over to America and because you have, with with a new apple, you have to be quite early. You you have to start quite early. And anyway, I was talking to a lady, Celia Stephen, who's we call the Lady Bramley. She's from the she's from the family who, who um, found um, the Bramley apple in Southwell. And um, I was chatting to her and said, "We'd well, love to do something." And we hit on or 
I said, I said, I said to her, it was at the uh, Bramley Festival. I said to her, we could have a, we could look for an apple. So what I did, I went on Radio Nottingham and asked just over the, the easiest way to get a new apple is to see if anybody's got a pip. Right. You know, you don't want to be spending years cross pollinating and things like that. So I just went on and thought, um, I asked, has anybody got out there got a pip that's been grown? from you know grown from a pip they've got an apple tree and they've got what looks like a decent apple um i wasn't expecting anybody but after about 10 minutes a lady in believe it or not southwall where the <laughs> bramley comes from rung up and said you've got one and i thought well okay yes it's um they've got an apple but normally what you get um, is not very good anyway i went and had a look and I could not believe the apple that I saw. It was a gorgeous apple. The tree was full of them. And um, um, from then on, I asked the people and said, would you, would you mind if we use this tree um, as a celebration for the pilgrims? Mm. And, and that is basically what, what happened. Um, it's been DNA tested. So it is a new variety. When I went out to check it, I looked. There was no graft or anything like that. So the DNA proved that it was a new variety and it's been registered as Pilgrim 400, which is, which is wonderful. So it's yeah. there forever. Um, that's that's amazing, the, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is amazing because... Um, like I said, it was amazing in the fact that it was only about 10 minutes before somebody rang up. And it's amazing that it comes from Southwell. Um, you never know. A bee could have gone over from the Bramley. And <laughs> I know it's half a mile or so away <laughs> as the crow flies, but wouldn't it be wonderful in, it, if it, in, in its DNA if it got a bit of Bramley as well? But yeah. it's there now, registered as Pilgrim 400. Wow. And, and what's the odds of two famous apples coming from the same place in Nottinghamshire you know oh, it... <laughs> not very okay you've got you've got quite a few apple growers you've got uh, Starkies um, and and Merryweathers who found the the apple but it wasn't them who created the apple it was Mrs Braithwaite's garden many many years ago um, over 200 now, isn't it, for the Bramley, mm. bless it, and it's still going. Um, but ours is a, a lovely apple as well, and we've got them grafted, we've got, and we're planting them. It was going to be a fantastic year for planting, but as, uh, of course everything's been changed. But uh, we are planting one at um, Retford Museum on Saturday. Yeah. It's after being our low key affair, but we are going to plant one. Well, that's fantastic. So, so the idea then came from, you know, taking some, uh, some pieces of the mother tree and then creating, um, you know, a series of, of trees. Was it around 30 trees that you, that you've grafted? It's, so um, what, what, what we've done, the, the, you've got the mother tree. So at the appropriate time, the 2016, that spring, I went to Pete Wilkinson, who um, actually just sent me a picture of some of the apples on the young trees this morning. And um, I went to Pete Wilkinson and asked him to graft me about 25. Mm. And he did, he grafted 25. And of course, from 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20, the, the, the ones I have now are four years old and in perfect condition to be planted in various places where the pilgrims are associated with. Yeah. So could you just explain, um, a, you know, what do you do with the grafting? It's, is it taking a piece from the mother tree and then attaching yes. it onto yeah. a, a rootstock? Yes. That's it, yes. Pete had got the rootstocks up at um, uh, Old England Nurseries at Sutton-on-Trent. So they have been grown in Nottinghamshire as well. They haven't gone Excellent. over the border or anywhere like that. Um, yes, you take a piece of the new wood or the wood that grew last year, the yeah. best quality you can find, and basically you have a stock, 
and you just make a cut really um, and make a cut on the on the cyan as it's called the piece of wood you've got, that, that you've got off the mother tree and match it up and then just wrap them up and being as in spring the sap is rising very quickly so long as the cambium layers are joined somewhere that sap keeps going and very quickly heals the wound and you start um, the, the, your stock, not sorry, not your stock, your scion, the yeah. new tree starts to grow and then it heals and you've got a new tree. Wow, <laughs> it's amazing. And I think when uh, on one of our meetings and we were talking about the tree, I mentioned um, that my maiden name is Bramley. And uh, no. although, you know, I don't have... Um, I can't find any ancestors that have come. We call it, I've always called it Southall, but you call it Southwell. Uh, I can't find any Bramleys from Southall, uh, but I've known about the, the Bramley apple, you know, my entire life. And my granddad, um, when he was alive, he was a miner and he loved his, uh, his garden. And I have such fond memories uh, going to talk to him in the garden. He'd be hoeing around his onions and then he'd take a break and we'd sit under his pride and joy, which his, was his Bramley apple tree. <laughs> we'd sit under that tree and have a little chat and a break. Uh, and I have such fond memories of doing that with my granddad. And, you know, and that link to the tree was just something that had been there from my childhood. And Yeah, I should yeah. think he had a Bramley because his name was Bramley. And, exactly. and it is wonderful to be, to think that, you, you know you've got the same name and um, and it, it's just a fantastic tree and how wonderful that that tree was just a pit you know it just happened to fall off another somebody put it in and we got one of the world's most famous uh, cooking apples I mean mm. they adore in Japan it's it's almost a god the Bramley is yeah. and um, you know they really really love it and we should treasure it more I think Oh, definitely. Who, who wouldn't want to treasure a Bramley? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, dear. Well, I'm kind of going off a bit off topic a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the idea started to, to form over, over a slice of cake at one of our meetings about finding a way to bring our two projects together. The idea was then to her to hold one of the apples from the mother tree and to link our projects together uh, within the bronze statue yes. uh, and so um, I remember when you brought we met up again and you brought me a collection of, of apples and I took them off to the foundry with me and they had such special treatment so whilst I was in the <laughs> photogrammetry rig the apples were being cradled um, on this little stand and a handheld scanner passed over them to capture every little bit of the texture of the skin. Um, and then I was also holding another uh, apple in my hand in the rig and they took a couple of shots with me holding the apple and then without so that they can make sure they got all of the, the parts of the finger right and then they could use that scan data as well to sort of pop the Scanned, a, scanned apple into my hand digitally so then the pilgrim 400 apple uh, became very much a part of the pilgrim statue it, it is phenomenal i've actually seen i saw the process of you um go at what you went through and everything and it, it, it's just been phenomenal to watch it and um ah oh, this the statues look looks absolutely gorgeous um, the, the lady who modelled it doesn't look too bad as well, I can assure you. <laughs> oh, you're very kind, John. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. But one of the interesting things, obviously for me, there's a lot of symbolism in that apple with my surname, or my maiden name being that of an apple, but, you know, there was, there's so many other meanings tied up and, um, you know, thinking about new beginnings and the pilgrims you know severing their roots from the midlands and traveling over yeah. to the new world and planting their seeds with the help of the uh, of the first nations 
so that they I know that they taught them how to grow quite specific crops and how to fertilize the land so there's a lot of mm. symbolism in that apple but in my recent um, episode I, I interviewed Susan who's a congregational church minister and um, she she thought it was the retelling of the origin story of you know uh, symbolizing Eve uh, through the apple and it's amazing yeah. that people see different things in that apple absolutely and this is this is why this is why we want to um, we plant them as many places as possible you see we've already planted scroobies um, I think the first tree had to go to scrooby more than anything um, than anywhere else with William Brewster um, um, I've got I've got the trees out here and they've all got a label on it's uh, Austerfield, Gainsborough um, loads of places there's three to go to Leiden in Holland of course because they spent a lot of time there didn't they Rachel they sure did and there's, so, there's quite a few places it's all exciting stuff really but sadly this year it's it's disappointed us all I think we'll get there in the end in yes. fact when I think about it they hadn't even gone yet had they I think it was it the 16th or something like that yeah um, the pilgrims left so we aren't even there yet <laughs> yes <laughs> there's still plenty of time and i think absolutely may, maybe as well you know stretching into next year where which would have been their very first thanksgiving um and their first harvest you know yes. it's, uh it they also you know planting the trees then you know just would um symbolize a lot more as well wouldn't it Yes, I've, I've, I've looked at that and thought, you know, that this is going to be their first year and uh, or next year is going to be their first year. So it's just as it's just as nice to be planting them next year as well. Um, yeah. And particularly like to get them in by spring. It's time they were in the ground. So um, we're going to make sure that they're all planted as we come out of spring. It's been fantastic chatting with you, John, and uh, you know, and uh, I, I hope the tree planting goes well this weekend. Um, so I'll be I'll be watching remotely because they're going to be recording. Uh, yes, your they planting, are. Aren't they? And uh, yeah. so I'll be I'll be watching it. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless you, Rachel. Oh, so thank it's you so to much. To you. Oh, thank you, John. Well, we're going to take a little break and we're going to be joined by Highcliffe Music and afterwards we're going to have another special guest. So let's return to the letters of Mary Brewster. She's writing to her daughter Patience, who's still in Leiden, Holland. And Mary reflects on the first difficult year, but with hope for the future. Plymouth Plantation 26th of November 1621. My dearest patients, I write to update you on the situation here that you may better plan your journey to join us. We are making good progress with the settlement and now have some seven houses built with four public buildings beside and for next year we plan a fine meeting house for worship and government matters. You did well to wait before joining us here for surely this first year has had its trials. Dear Dorothy Bradford survived for only one month after our arrival in the New World. In early December last year there was a commotion. Dorothy had fallen from the deck of the Mayflower and drowned. Nothing could be done to save her. Your father had to break the news of her passing to poor William Bradford on his return from a scouting mission some days later. He was for many weeks inconsolable, being convinced that Dorothy would still be with us had he not left the ship. In the harshest of winters, 45 souls, nearly half of our number, have been taken early to be with the Lord. Poor Priscilla Mullins lost her father, William, and later after the spring came her mother Alice and her younger brother Joseph. Fortunately, she has the solace of the fond attention of John Alden. They have plans to marry ere long. Earlier this month, an approaching ship caused fear and a scramble to arms, as it was presumed to be a hostile foreign invader. We waited anxiously on the shore as the boat approached. 
Imagine our relief when the flag came into view and we saw that it was a friendly ship from England. But patience, you know what's coming next. I could not believe my eyes when I espied my very own firstborn, your brother Jonathan, waving and smiling down from the deck. What a moment of utter bewildered rejoicing. We had no idea the fortune was on its way, much less that Jonathan was amongst its cargo of hale and hearty young men. My joy was tempered by Jonathan's deeply saddening news of the loss of his young wife and child back in Leyden, prompting him to make the early crossing. We were delighted also to see your father's old friend Robert Cushman disembark the fortune. What joy that God had seen him delivered to us in the new world, having recovered the ill health which prevented him from travelling with us on the Mayflower. I fear he will not be with us long, though, as he intends to return with the fortune in a few short weeks, taking a cargo of beaver and other furs, handicrafts and timber, to start repaying our debts in the old country. There was much excitement after the fortune's arrival. Of the four women on the boat, one, Martha Ford, gave birth to a son the very night after the ship docked. Tending to her reminded me of the night Oceanus Hopkins was born on the Mayflower. Although he is still with us, he is a sickly child who I fear may not see out the next winter. We hope and pray for him and all the other children. Your two brothers are quite well and grown strong from this outdoor life and helping in the fields. Praise be. The arrival of the fortune prompted us to make haste with a feast of thanksgiving which we had been planning with our Native American friends, the Wampanoag. We should surely never have survived this first year without the friendly cooperation of their leader, the Massasoit, with whom we were able to sign an early treaty of peace and cooperation. He and ninety of his men joined with us and the fortune passengers at the feast. We ate wild turkeys, fish and meat, and the Massasoit and his men brought deer, which we roasted over the fire and all enjoyed. We would never have learned how to tame this foreign soil without the assistance of one Native American of the Patuxet tribe. Tis Quantum, who we affectionately call Squanto. He had spent time in Europe and was able to communicate with us in English. His entire tribe had been wiped out by disease, which I fear may have been brought to them by earlier European adventurers. Squanto has truly been a blessing from the Lord. He has been our translator, guide and farming adviser. Our familiar crops from England and Holland mostly failed, but Squanto has taught us well and brought us from near starvation to the blessed celebration of this abundant harvest thanksgiving. We look forward to the next year with ample food in store and great confidence in our ability to thrive here. When my two daughters make safe their crossing to join us, my happiness will be complete. So, make haste, patience, to secure a passage for you and your sister, Fear. Perhaps in the spring, when the weather will be fair and the oceans will guide you gently to us. Until then, we must all trust in the Lord. With very much love to all, Mother. I'd like to welcome our next special guest to the podcast, Anita, who is the manager of Bakewell Old House. Welcome to the podcast, Anita. Thank you. Hi, Rachel. Lovely to be here. Oh, thank you. And thanks for agreeing to uh, come and chat with us. Um, could, you, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your job role at the museum? Certainly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been at the museum for around 14 years now. I'm the manager, administrator, and I generally look after the sites. I look after the volunteers. I did have around 84 volunteers last year, but some have fallen by the wayside due to Corona, which I mean, they've just, um, they're not coming back at the moment as they are classed as vulnerable. Uh, we organize events, do the marketing, you name it, I kind of do it at the museum and um, generally look after the, this Tudor building. It's, it's such an amazing place and for people who have not uh, visited Bakewell Old House Museum before, uh, could you give us sort of, could you sum up or paint a picture uh, for listeners of, um, of what your museum offers? Yeah, sure. It's... Um, it was built in 1534 for the Gell family, 
who actually built the Tudor house as a tax collector's house or tithe collector's house. They collected the tithes from the villagers for the church um, and they also built a barn. We think the cottages next door to the museum are actually about the barns that house the tithes and the tithes were a tenth of what uh, the villagers grew it could be grains or oats or wool or whatever however the way they made their living that was the tithes um, mm. the building it's absolutely fascinating it doesn't particularly look Tudor from outside it is a stone built building and has a stone roof but when you step inside there are massive rooms beamed ceilings and big open fireplaces sort of very typical of the Tudor time the it is a vernacular building it was built from materials that were around it from local stone and wood from across the valley so it's very very atmospheric unfortunately we were also very hidden away because we're right behind Batewell church not in the center of Batewell so lots of people don't know where we are and you can't see us from any road Yes, <laughs> yeah, it, is, it is quite a, a trek up a very, very steep hill and then a very tight left turn down your little drive. But then yeah. it suddenly opens out and there's your museum and it, it's such an amazing building and place it's, to go and explore. Yeah, it, it's lovely and it's amazing it survived because it, during the 1950s it was uh, due to be demolished by the local town council it had fallen into disrepair it had become a tenement building sort of prior to the 1950s Richard Arkwright had owned the, the old house and he housed his mill workers inside he, he used the massive space to convert into five interior cottages and added a sixth one at the front of the building the uh, mill workers were working at Lumford Mill, which was in Bakewell, which tragically burned down. Um, uh, from then, it did become a sort of a farmhouse and tenement building. But there were people still living in there in the 1950s. Right. The Bakewell Industry Historical Society were formed in order to save the building from demolition. Um, as you may or may not know in the 1950s the fashion was to cover all the beam ceilings with ply board to cover up all its unique features and a local builder went in there and started ripping away at the, the, the walls and he just discovered these amazing spaces these amazing fireplaces and he recognized the importance of the building so luckily we're saved yeah <laughs> and you know it's it's amazing to think that that could have been lost and because it's just such a, a treasure trove of different times throughout you know the last 500 years isn't it really it is indeed i mean it will be 500 in uh, 2034 so i hope i'm around to see that day yes. <laughs> <laughs> we make that's going to be a magical year it'll be amazing um although the building is architecturally fascinating the, we are very lucky to have a donated collection of over 9,000 items and then we've got some really quirky items within the museum, an elephant's foot, even an elephant's foot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a story about, about a visiting circus to Bakewell and we've got ceramics, we've got industrial tools, cameras, a toy room. Uh, and a very important uh, textile collection mm. uh, and a large textile collection, over 2,000 textile objects and accessories and dresses, costumes. And it, it was for that reason that um, I came to see you a couple of years ago before, well, at the very beginnings of my Mayflower project. And I knew I wanted to look at uh, sort of to the Tudor time and with a, a view of looking at the, the separatists that were from the uh, Midlands and South Yorkshire uh, that fled and then ultimately left uh, England's shores on the Mayflower. 
Uh, and I really wanted to get a sense of the clothing and the objects. So coming to your museum, it's it shows the very a very different side of Tudor life because obviously we've got the fantastic Gainsborough Old Hall, uh, which is you know a, a fantastic, uh, splendid medieval building, but yes, yeah. that shows the you know a side of life that only the rich and the few had, whereas Bakewell Old House Museum really shows a different side of Tudor life, and by you can walk around it and you could really imagine families living in those rooms you know it's a, a little yeah. bit more yeah. a little more down to earth isn't it <laughs> <laughs> it certainly is it is more down to earth we, we, we never compare ourselves with Chatsworth <laughs> <laughs> or Hardwick Hall <laughs> yeah. um, it, it is it shows a normal sort of way of life um, and um, People, I mean, they did live there. We've got a solar like Gainsborough Hall has, which I think was a sitting kind of sitting room or resting room. And they did have maids in the building, but probably not very many. Yeah, um, the main house place was used for cooking, and there would have been larders and stores to store uh, their food. Mm. And it is, a, it is a very magical space. I'm very pleased to work there and I've been privileged to work there for the last 14 years. Yeah, it, it is. It's, it is such an amazing, fascinating place. And yeah. um, when I came to visit you on one, of, one occasion, we started talking about textiles. And um, so you pointed me in a few different directions. One was to introduce me to the, uh, this, this fantastic book, a pattern book called The Tudor Tailor. Yes. which um you know was was great because i could see how tudor outfits were made um but particularly things that i was interested in is that it showed tudor outfits going through the different strata of society from peasants and poor people to working class to merchant class to upper classes to the elite and to be able to see that range of dresses but then you also um, suggested that I visited the church that you've just mentioned that's next door because they have some some tombs and these tombs are really highly decorated aren't they with um, imagery yes. of Tudor time yes yeah they're, they're fascinating it's we're lucky to be so close to the church and uh, we've got this this lovely heritage you know sort of on the doorstep really and um, our visitors are, to the museum will often visit the church. It's also got a very ancient Saxon cross shaft in the churchyard, which is again is fascinating. Really, mm. uh, yeah. The uh, the cost, the Tudor tailor. We did use that pattern book ourselves to create an outfit for our model, Christopher Plant, who was the tax collector. And it is an amazing book and some of the techniques are really specialised and I, I did listen to your Gainsborough uh, uh, podcast and it was fascinating to hear the, the lady who made your costume and all, all the detail and attention to detail was, was incredible. Yeah, it is. And I suppose one of the things that uh, paintings and, uh, and carved tombs can offer it is that that glimpse into the past because I suppose that it must be very difficult to find examples of textiles that still survive from that Tudor period. Yeah they, they generally don't and um, I don't know if you've ever been to the Mary Rose exhibition in Plymouth uh, where they, they brought up the Mary Rose from the ocean floor but they do have some examples of um, archers leather jerkins which were were underneath the mud in the um, the harbour where the ship sank right Henry, Henry VIII was watching from a nearby hill as the ship sank and they do ha actually have some examples from all those years ago which is incredible mm. um, but we we certainly don't have uh, anything as old as that I think our oldest uh, costume is around 1840 uh, and is a wedding dress and is on display at the moment in the museum we have got a bridal exhibition on display 
through the ages so um but yes it, it's it's unfortunate and i think you also mentioned that um it's it's often the the very decorative and gowns and that survive and um maids outfits and things just don't really survive we've got a few from the 1920s but um yes it's sad to lose those those mm. textiles yeah so by so having these other sources uh you know and and these pattern books like the Tudor Taylor has just been well I found it invaluable to myself and it sounds like it's an invaluable tool for your museum as well to bring to life the clothing because I, th I think that's one of the things that have this has worked so well with this sculpture project is that you know where possible such attention to detail was emphasized on the different parts of that Tudor woman you know, and that when the separatists left, when they left at our shores and headed off, you know, the fashion was, you know, it had not changed very much for the working classes from the medieval period. And the more I find out about it and the more places I go to visit, the more I'm intrigued to sort of see what they wear. And often things like paintings and uh, statues and things in like um, grave grave markings and uh, ornamentation are, are a great resource to be able to go and see some of these pieces aren't they yeah they, they are and they they fill in those gaps don't they and it, it, it's they're an incredible incredible resource that's right uh, I, I only wish we had more sort of tudorish items but we don't really <laughs> <laughs> But there was one item that you very kindly loaned to me and it was during my first artist residency in my series of residences as part of this project where I was um, artist in residence for Nottingham's Industrial Museum and they were having a, a big open day and I wanted to dress as a Tudor lady and um, you said well we actually have one Tudor uh, replica gown uh, come and see if it fits. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing, wasn't it? I mean, I was just blown away because you put this outfit on. It was. It could have been made just made for you. It was fitted perfectly. <laughs> yes, and the and the story as well of who made it is just as fascinating a uh, story as well, isn't it? I mean, would you would you be happy to share with us a, a bit about the maker? Yeah, so it was Nancy Pulley, who sadly is not with us anymore. But Nancy was just the most incredible woman. She was uh, a Bletchley girl during World War II and kept the secret of Bletchley Park for uh, many, many, many years. Um, but she also worked for Hardy Amis. And what she didn't know about textiles just wasn't worth knowing. You know, she was an absolutely fascinating lady um the we do have a textile team at the museum and sadly they are in the vulnerable category so they're not actually coming in at the moment uh, uh but it's the knowledge that is passed down from these important characters that have been involved with the museum and they've got fascinating backgrounds you know and that that's it's really important so uh if anyone is interested in joining us, our volunteer textile team, please do get in touch. <laughs> yeah, because it's it really does bring to life history because there's you know there's one thing walking around and looking at things, but then to actually experience yes, it yes. by putting on those clothes, you know, and yeah. it, often it changes your posture, the way that you move because of the, the sheer amount of fabric that's <laughs> wrapped around your legs. You know, it's not an easy task to walk around in a Tudor outfit. And I've no idea how, um, how women worked in all of those, <laughs> those layers. <laughs> that's right. It's amazing. And, and they do, and costumes generally, I do feel look wonderful on people i mean we put we use sort of dummies and models to display them but there's nothing like putting it on a on a person and what and as you say it affects the way you walk and the way you move and the way you hold yourself so it, it is lovely but sadly we can't do that because uh, for one thing they're, they're our historic costumes are all very small and don't, don't fit 
affect people and it would damage them by mm. wearing them so the oils from our bodies would maybe damage the fabric so so we don't do that which is sad yeah. which is i suppose <laughs> even more important when you've got a, a team of fantastic um you know te- seamstresses and that you know they can bring that bit of history to life by making a replica but authentic <laughs> costume oh yes yeah that's uh, i we would really love someone to tackle you know uh, making some for for the old house so if anyone's out there listening who's willing to have a go <laughs> um yes our, our team were more about the conservation of the of the fabrics and the materials and the collection and uh, and arranging exhibitions which our textile exhibitions change every two years although we may keep the bridal one up because we've been closed for most of this year. We've only just opened uh, last week to the public. So this br- the bridal exhibition may stay up. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you so much, Anita, for chatting to me. And um, is there um, any online resources that uh, people can go to? Uh, yeah, we do have a website. And although we, we've got a, a new website, in the making at the moment thank you to arts council england um but our sort of ju- just our main one at the moment is oldhousemuseum.org.uk until we move move over to our new website we've also got a facebook page bakewell old house museum lovely talking to you rachel really yeah. lovely thank you so much anita well please do join me for my next episode which is going to be a very special one titled Children of the Mayflower, a special edition for Baby Loss Awareness Week. Spirit of Mayflower is part of a series celebrating my Spirit of Mayflower project. You can get involved in lots of ways. You can take a look at some of the movies and pictures I took on my journey by heading to the Rachel Carter Sculpture Facebook page. You can also head to my website at www rachelcarter.co.uk and there you'll be able to view some of the sculptures I make, treat yourself to a limited edition Pilgrim Woman sculpture or take a look at some of the online tutorials 